if you have your Bibles, and it's becoming less and less frequent for people to bring their Bibles to church. And I get it. We all have these wonderful devices filled with nothing but richness and joy and truth and, and everything that we desire. Um, so you, you, most of you have Bibles on a digital device of some kind. Um, I still am a believer in the physical book, um, and I think it's a, a wonderful thing to continue to bring our Bibles to church. Another reason why having visuals is a pro and a con, because I can throw all the verses on the screen and you don't have to uh, bring your Bibles. You can just trust that what I put up here is accurate, and uh, um, someday I might just trick you sometime and we'll see how well that works. But having your Bibles is a beautiful thing. And so if you have them, either in uh, your hand or on your device, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 is where I want you to be. I do have a kid's quiz, though, so while you are getting yourself uh, to Matthew chapter 2, if I could have Toby and maybe Jaden. Oh, never mind, Jaden. All right, Aby. Aby. Um, I have done this tradition for many, many years of just having a little interactive time with the young people in the congregation to start the sermon. Call it a kid's quiz. It's fun. It is not uh, intended to be complicated. So we're going to be looking at the story of the Magi. So question number one, what led the Magi to Israel? What was it that led them? Was it a map? When you think about the story of the Magi, any of our young people here, kids, teens, want to see if you would participate with us? I see you guys over there. Don't think you can hide from me. All right, Abel, help us out. What led the Magi to Israel? The star. All right, it was a star. It was a star. We're going to talk about that star. Where did they come from? Okay, where did they come from? To be helpful, what direction did they come from? Did they come from the ocean sea? Did they come from the deserts in the south? Did they come from... Oh, I see Leah. We're going to have Leah a chance. The east? They came from the east. The east. Very broad definition. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. What was their occupation? Ooh. They're called magi. What do they do for a living? All right, Jaden, lay down some knowledge on us. Astronomers. Astronomers, yes. Astronomy and astrology were kind of intermixed at, at this time. wasn't different scientific disciplines. There's more ways of describing their occupation. Any other young people want to share what it was these magi did for a living? They studied the stars. I say, Don, Don, if you put your hand up, it's like bidding. You're going to get called on. All right, we'll leave it at that because we're going to get into the story. They were kind of the scientists, the scholars of their day. There was a religious tone to what they did as well. Number four, where did they find Jesus? Where did they find Jesus? We sometimes mix stories together. Abel, you seem so confident. Oh, Adon. Let's give Adon a chance. Adon. Bethlehem. They found him in Bethlehem. Abel, did you want to say something as well? They found him in Bethlehem in a manger. They found him in a manger. Is that true? Ah, oh, no, you can't. I'm sorry. You've already rung in the answer. We sometimes get the stories uh, combined, and there's pros and cons between Luke and Matthew and their two nativity stories. All right, last question. Now, think about this carefully. What gifts did the Magi give to the baby Jesus? What gifts? Oh, Taylor, way in the back. Thank you for making Toby exercise today. Dylan, we might come to you as well. Uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And how do you spell myrrh? <laughs> no, spell it, buddy. M-Y-R-R-H. Whoa. Did you just look it up or something? Or did you just... My, oh my. Myrrh is one of the hardest words to spell. But he got it without even hesitation. M-Y-R-R-H. How many other words... Do you spell like that? Uh, that's a tough one. So well done, well done to our, uh, our soon departing Taylor. Thank you for blessing us with that moment. Thank you, Toby and A.B. That's, that's uh, the quiz for today. Matthew chapter 2. Do you have it there in your Bibles? Follow along with me as we read. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. Your Bibles may say wise men. Most Bibles say wise men. 
the New American Standard that I'm reading from uses Magi. Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Notice, all Jerusalem is not excited about this. They are troubled at the coming of these foreigners, these Gentiles, asking the question, where is your king? Gathering together, Herod did all the chief priests and the scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, they knew right where? In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Quoting from the book of Micah. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, report to me that I may too come and worship him. And after hearing the king, they went on their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the Christ child was. Notice how the star is very unique. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, coming into the house, so Jesus is not in a manger at this point. They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground. They worshiped him. Must have been quite the moment for Mary and Joseph. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and M-Y-R-R-H, myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. And they slip from Scripture and history and are never mentioned again. Who are these people? Where did they come from, aside from this direction, the east? How many were there? Of course, tradition uh, puts three of them, most likely because there were three gifts, but there's no actual mention that there were three of them. There were more than one, obviously, but there could have been more than three. Their actual number is never actually recorded. How did they know the star was the sign of the Messiah? Why, being foreigners, did they come to worship the king of the Jews? Why did they bring gifts, and what was the meaning or symbolism behind them? What happened to them after their pilgrimage to Bethlehem? What is their legacy? They are some of the most mysterious individuals in history and Scripture. They suddenly appear and then disappear, and are never mentioned again. A mere 12 verses in Matthew contains the entire narrative, and yet they have become centerpieces in the life and story of Christ and of the Christmas nativity. We know less of them in those 12 verses than we do of the 12 apostles, and yet they, being among the earliest believers and worshipers of the incarnate Christ, have an enormous celebration in Christian history. Prophecy seems to have predicted them. Isaiah chapter 60 says, For behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the people, but the Lord will rise upon you, His glory will appear to you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your coming. Psalm says something similar in Psalm 72. Let the nomads of the desert bow before Him, and His enemies shall lick the dust. Let the kings of Tarshish and the islands bring presents. That would be the west. The kings of Sheba and Seba, that would be the east, they shall offer gifts and let all kings bow down before him, all nations serve him. Therefore, it's not incorrect necessarily to call them kings, as we do in the song, We Three Kings. Yet they were not kings in the customary sense. Tradition has romanticized them and exaggerated them greatly. Vast amounts of ink has been spilled, filling volumes of books discussing the Magi. They've been given names, ethnicities, backstories, histories, personalities, far exceeding the biblical or historical records. There was Melchior, king of Persia, Kaspar, king of India, and Balthazar, king of Arabia. 
Even these fantastic, even though these fantastic identities intrigue the mind and have ancient origins going back as far as 500 AD, they are nothing more than fiction, built on imaginations, fitting more into mythology and folklore rather than history and reality. Yet the truth of the Magi remains fascinating in their contribution to the story of Christ, His life, and His mission to save all mankind. Luke completely omits them from his Christmas story, despite assuring Theophilus in his opening verses that, quote, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, he is either unaware of the visit of the Magi, or he was not inspired to include it for reasons for which it is pointless to speculate. He gives a very detailed account of the experience of the Holy Family in Bethlehem, the rejection of lodging, the first cradle being a manger, the story of the shepherds, the dedication in the temple, even naming Simeon and Anna. So many people in this story have no names. We don't know the names of the shepherds. We don't know the names of the Magi, biblically. Uh, we don't know the names of many of the, the important events of Christ's life, but we know Simeon and we know Anna because of Luke's detailed account. He also talks about the completion of the Jewish purification rites before they return to Nazareth in Galilee. But he makes no mention of the Magi or the wrath of Herod or the slaughter of the innocents or the flight to Egypt in his account. After acknowledging a period of some 40 days in Bethlehem, Luke simply sends the family home to Nazareth. It is likely that the Magi appeared around that time, the end of the 40-day period of purification for Mary. And in contemplation of the Magi, it is helpful to try to harmonize the stories of Luke and Matthew as far as possible to understand the circumstances of the visit of the Magi. Luke tells us that upon the immediate birth of the Lord, angels appeared to the shepherds nearby. This is the traditional Christmas story that we read from Luke chapter 2. He tells us, suddenly there appeared with the angel, quote, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God. Now, apparently this multitude of the heavenly host was bright enough and glorious enough for the shepherds that were working in the hills of Bethlehem, but no one else seemed to see these angels. No other glorious uh, 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 account is made of everyone else in Bethlehem saying, hey, did you see the strobe light last night? This seems to be a miraculous event visible only to the eyes of these shepherds, as there are other very similar accounts of others seeing angels while others couldn't see them. You think of the servant of Elisha, who uh, said, hey, I don't know how we're going to escape this battle. And Elisha said, open the eyes of Gehazi. And Gehazi looks out and he sees the hills filled with angels. So angels have the ability to appear to whom they want to see uh, uh, want to see them, or perhaps it has to do with the faith of those who are looking. But notice that the shepherds see a multitude of the heavenly host. This miraculous and marvelous moment in the night sky of Bethlehem may be the origin of the appearance of what looked to the Magi to be a new star shining in the sky. Note that the star they followed did not behave like any ordinary star. It moved, it directed, and it even according to Matthew, stood over the place where the child was. It also seemed to be invisible to other observers. Astronomers and astrologers of the day who tracked the night skies, even back then, make no mention of this star. No one else in Jerusalem or even in Bethlehem seems to have seen this star or followed its path. Now, there have been many extraordinary efforts to trace the cosmological identity of this star, and some charming theories and suggestions have been made of this particular star, of everything from a constellation to a planet in its orbit, or even the work of UFOs. But simply put, none of them are consistent with the plain text of the revealed Word of God. If any of you seen the, the Star of Bethlehem video, it's fascinating, but it just doesn't reconcile with Scripture. It's really cool. It just doesn't reconcile with Scripture. The best interpretation of the origin and identity of this star is that it was not an actual star, but rather a glorious angel, perhaps Gabriel himself, or the same host of angels who appeared briefly to the shepherds, but to no one else, and then remained visible in the heavens to the distant stargazers who would be drawn to their light and directed to the Messiah. Again, Scripture is our foundation for this interpretation. In various places in Scriptures, stars are symbols for angels. 
In Revelation 1.16, John sees stars in the right hand of the glorious being who appears to him. He sees stars. But a few verse later, verses later, he's told in Revelation 1.20, As for the mystery of the stars which you saw in my right hand, the seven stars are seven angels of the seven churches. In the book of Daniel, which will be very important in the story of the Magi, Daniel 12.3 says, Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse, and those who lead the many to righteous are like the stars forever and ever. <coughs> Where's my light? Always such bad timing. I need a drink. Could you get a water for me? The concept of angels appearing or behaving like stars is an accepted and explicit biblical teaching. So it is a good suggestion that the star that directed the Magi was probably the appearance of a glorious angel. So on the night of the birth of Jesus, angels appeared to the shepherds and Magi alike. But unlike the shepherds who were nearby and told directly what their meaning was, the Magi were far away and it would take them some weeks to travel to the home of the Messiah. And it would seem it was only through their knowledge of, Hebrew, of the Hebrew Scriptures. Thank you, brother. Pardon me. Too many Christmas sweets already. And it would seem it was only through their knowledge of the Hebrew Scriptures and their study of nature, their openness to God, and their ability to hear God in dreams that they could come to the conclusion as to the meaning of the new object shining brightly in the sky. So who were the Magi? Oh man, there are so many books on this. As a matter of fact, just last year, a new book was published by a journalist called The Wise Men, uh, where they postulate that they were Nabataeans, only coming from southern Jordan, the area of Petra. And there's some interesting arguments made in there, but I think uh, looking at it from a more traditional and, and ancient sense probably is the better way of looking at it. Notice I'm choosing to use the word magi rather than kings or wise men, although these titles have validity as well. Magi is from where we get the modern word of magician, yet the two are so far apart, it's like comparing the counterfeit to the genuine. The magi were part of an intellectual aristocracy of many Eastern nations. In today's parlance, we would call them scholars, scientists, priests, and spiritual advisors all wrapped into one. They dwelt among the temples and centers of the religion of Persia, Arabia, and Mesopotamia, and many places anciently described as the East. They were employed by the nobility to be experts in the occult, natural law, and all things supernatural. They followed in the exact line and traditions of Daniel and his friends who dwelt in the court of Nebuchadnezzar and the Persian and Median kings who followed. And it's from there that we see an interesting connection to the wisdom and knowledge of the Magi to the Old Testament biblical record. While it's possible that they could have divined the meaning of the star without any direct spirit, scriptural reference, their direct question and certainty of the meaning of the star is of interest. They proclaim, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. This statement suggests a wealth of clarity and understanding as to their, mi to their mission and the meaning of of that moment, and it is likely from their access to the Old Testament sources in combination with their faith and visions and dreams, they came to this knowledge and understanding. Now, Daniel, as mentioned before, was a servant of the Babylonian and Persian kingdoms. In Jesus' day, the modern empire of Parthia was the inheritors of that kingdom. It is from this empire, I believe, the Magi originated. And while it's been many centuries since Daniel had lived and died, his legacy and writings were cherished and, and maintained even in the pagan lands of his captivity. Daniel himself, in Daniel 11.1, 1, declares himself an encouragement and protector of Darius the Mede. The entire volume of Daniel was probably accessible to the Magi, and in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, we read, I kept looking, Daniel says, in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, this passage is massive in its scope, and should the Magi have read it, they could have considered it an indicator of the coming king, born king of the Jews, but to be worshipped by all peoples and nations. 
Daniel 8 describes the rise and fall of nations and the power of the little horn causing stars to fall to the earth. Daniel 9 describes the exact timing of the coming of the king when it says in verse 25, you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It'll be built again, the plaza, the moat, even in times of distress. Now the decree there, you are to know discern from the issuing of the decree was a Persian decree. It was the decree of Artaxerxes in 457 BC and probably well known to the Parthian Magi. And they were able to calculate the timing as readily as we are today, that the Messiah would come about that time period after the issuing of the decree. In addition to the scriptures of Daniel, it's likely the Magi were also aware of Esther and Mordecai, the prophecies of Balaam, as well as the exploits and scriptures pertaining to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose origins were also in the east. Again, this is all speculation, but it aligns with the story of the Magi. So to recap, upon seeing the star, the new star, the Magi are illuminated to understand it as a fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel and other scriptures and stories. And they understand that this king would be king of all, and they yearn to worship and acknowledge him. Assuming they were from the cultural and religious centers of the Parthian Empire, a city called Satisiphon on the banks of the Tigris River near the present day of Baghdad, it would have taken them several weeks to travel by caravan to get to Israel. They would, have to, they would have had to have made nearly two dozen stops at trade centers, wadis, and oases along the way. Thus, they arrived sometime after the end of Mary's 40 days of purification and therefore pre present and, and then present their valuable gifts after Jesus was dedicated in the temple. Now, normally, when Jesus is brought into the temple for his, his dedication on his eighth day, the normal sacrifice would have been a lamb. That's what Moses had commanded. That's what Leviticus 12 said. Whenever you have a baby, a lamb was to be sacrificed as part of the dedication. However, if you were poor, a substitute dedication was allowed to turtle doves. And that is what Joseph and Mary presented at that dedication. So we know the Magi could not have come before that because those three gifts would have made them vastly wealthy. And it would not have been appropriate for them to offer the poor man's sacrifice for the birth of Jesus. Therefore, it's clear the Magi arrived after this time. The gifts themselves were vastly dear and do not appear random or unintentional. And while the Magi may have had access to Jewish teachings, prophecies, and religious ideas, there's no indication that they were proselytes or converts. Their gifts likely would have come from their religious context. Now, I don't have a problem with God having dual meanings with these things. I don't have any problem with us looking at the Jewish connotation to what frankincense and myrrh and gold represent, because I think God can direct things in such a way. But from the perspective of the Magi, I think they thought of them from their Zoroastrian uh, meaning, coming from the Persian kingdom. Of course, it's only speculation, but I believe their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh was rather an indicator that he is king of earth, the gold, king of heaven, the frankincense, and king of the realm of the dead, myrrh. That was what they would have thought of in the ancient uh, uh, kingdom of Persia or Parthia. And that was their indication they are accepting Jesus as the king of all the realms of existence. And we can parse that out into other ways of why these uh, gifts represent us. The frankincense that burns and its fragrant incense wafts up towards the heavens and it gives uh, sacrifice to the gods of the heavens. The myrrh that was to bless the dead bodies as they went on their way to the underworld. And of course, gold was the symbol of the power of the earthly kingdoms of kings. So I believe that was their intent when they gave those gifts of acknowledging that Jesus was the king, the authority, the ruler of all realms of existence. Although we see the frankincense in the sacrificial system of the sanctuary and the myrrh of how uh, dead the, uh, those who would be uh, dying or even Jesus as the lamb and the sacrifice, and that's fine too. It's not entirely different from the Judeo-Christian symbolism. Not knowing the quantities, it's hard to determine their exact value, but even extremely small amounts of these items would have made Joseph and Mary quite wealthy compared to the average Jewish family. According to the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, frankincense and myrrh were of equal or even greater value than gold in Jesus' day. Myrrh, even in modern times today, can sell upwards of $80,000 a pound for pure concentrated myrrh. These were enormously, so even if they were tiny amounts, it would have made the Holy Family extremely wealthy by those standards of the day. After dispensing their gifts, the Magi take their leave and being warned by God in a dream, 
they depart to their own country. And thus they slip from history and scriptural reference and are never heard from again. So what is the message, the meaning and legacy of the Magi? And of course, there are hundreds of ways to interpret and decipher their role in the biblical story. Angels still beckon today, and those who are wise will see and follow. Believers will be among the minority who understand and seek to worship the true king. That many, even those of his own race and religion, will not recognize the coming of Christ. That Jesus is king truly of heaven, earth, and even the grave itself. That Jesus was worthy of worship even before his perfect life and death. And this one I really like. They did not wait for Jesus to die on the cross and be resurrected to worship Him. He was worthy of worship just for coming as a baby. And sometimes we miss that even in the Christian church. We say, well, you need to worship God because He died on the cross. You need to worship God because He rose from the dead. You need to worship God because He lived a perfect life. And those are true things. Those are wonderful things. But had Jesus never come, He would still be worthy of worship. If Jesus was still in heaven, He would still be our Lord. He did double what He was needed by coming and offering Himself as our innocent Savior on the cross. But He was already worthy of our worship and devotion even before that. He was willing to do that in addition to being worthy of worship. And I like that the wise men give us that example. Jesus deserves our very best gifts and sacrifices. That He was King of the Jews, but understanding that the mission of the Jewish nation and therefore the Jewish King was to bring salvation to all nations. And this is one of the puzzling aspects that many have wondered. Why are these pagans, why are these heathens coming? They don't identify Him as the King of the world. They don't identify Him as the King of all, you know, all the earth or all the nations. They specifically say, we have come to worship the King of the Jews. And yet, I do not believe that they had become Jews themselves, but rather through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they came to understand that the purpose of the Jewish nation was to bring salvation to all. So they would love to see, they would love to worship the King of the Jews, understanding that that was His mission. And that too is our mission as Christians today. There's no contradiction in worshiping the King of the Jews, for in so de doing you are accepting the gift of God's salvation to all mankind. The Jews were never meant to be a religion unto themselves. The king of the Jews was never meant to simply be a representative, representation of just an ethnic geographical boundary. It was always intended to be a gift and an, uh, an emissary, an ambassador of the truth and gospel of God to the whole world. As the true king, and I haven't talked much about Herod, but I'll just mention it here. As the true king brought peace, hope, and life to mankind... The false king, Herod, brought only death, violence, and hatred, ordering the slaughter of babies in Bethlehem. And it's always puzzled people. God directed this event. What, what was the purpose of allowing those children to die? And it's one of the great challenges of understanding the plan of God in this. However, just suffice to say, Herod stands as the typical Antichrist. Yet it was this king the Jews chose to listen to rather than the true king in Bethlehem. Albeit reluctantly, the Jewish nation accepted Herod and the sons and the, those who would come after Herod to be their leaders, and they crucified Jesus. They handed Jesus over. This, from the very beginning of when the wise men came, sets up the story of Jesus and the Antichrist right from the outset. Who will be the true king? The one who brings life or the one who brings death? As the Magi were clearly searching the Scriptures and the signs of the times for the works and plan of God, so should we today also be continuing to search the Scriptures and watch for God's work to be accomplished among us. And again, it will be a minority of the world that will be ready to see the King when He comes the second time, just as it was a minority of the world that was ready for Jesus when He came the first time. And lastly, one of the messages that I see in the story of the Magi is that Jesus is worth the journey. Jesus is worth the journey. What happened to the Magi after this story? We don't know, and only theories can be suggested. They returned to the country, to their own country, and they likely continued to serve in the capacity they had before as advisors and servants of the Parthian Empire and people. But I believe they retained their faith in Christ and likely spread the message of the incarnate king. 
The book of Acts focuses on the spread of Christianity in the Greek and Roman world. But it's interesting to note that in Acts 2, on the day of the end gathering, we are told that Jews from every nation under heaven um, heard the apostles speaking in tongues. Sixteen different national and ethnic people are mentioned in Acts chapter 2. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 8, How is it that we hear each of them in our own language to which we were born? And notice which nations are mentioned absolutely first in the list of nations there that were listening to them. Parthians and Medes, Elamites, and the residents of Mesopotamia. This is the exact area that the Magi would have come from. Now, these are Jews being referred to in Acts chapter 2. Yet it's interesting that when the message of Jesus is presented to these Jews in Acts chapter 2, they are ready and open and willing to accept the Savior. And it just makes me wonder if for 30 years in Parthia and Persian, the Magi had been teaching about the king that had come and been born in Israel. And it was just the catalyst that they needed when they came into Israel that they heard Peter speak about this very Jesus that maybe they heard of for three decades. Just supposition. I can't prove it to you. I just find it interesting that the very first nations mentioned as recipients of the gospel of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 2 were Parthians, the very place where the Magi had come from. And when Peter called for their allegiance to Christ, they were ready. The day of Pentecost was the final catalyst God used. And who knows? But we do know that as the gospel spread in the east, The early church historian Eusebius in the 4th century, only 300 years after the events of the Bible, Eusebius says that Thomas went to India and China, Bartholomew went to Parthia, Mesopotamia, Andrew to Scythia and Armenia, and in every location found hearts and minds willing to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that it could be said what what Paul said is true, that in Colossians 1.6, In all the world, the gospel is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. And in Romans chapter 10, their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. And in Romans 1.18, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And while we don't often think about the success of the Christian missions in the East because Scripture points us more to the West, it's clear that historically the, uh, the apostles found willing ears to hear the truth of Jesus Christ as they went into these regions. Could it be that God continued to use these wise men after they had left Bethlehem? Again, it is only a suggestion, only a guess, but maybe they were the John the Baptists that paved the way For when the true story of Jesus came, people would know and hear and be converted. It's a fascinating idea. I can't prove it to you, but I find it very interesting. What would you be willing to do to show your love and worship to the King of the Jews? What journey would you be willing to take? What undertaking, what amount of time and money would you invest in seeing the King? Would you give of your best gifts? Would you be willing to share your faith even though it's mostly unpopular? Would you be a willing vessel to allow God to tell His story through you? Would you be an offering to God?